Uh, welcome everyone who's signed on so far. Um, so um, Colin is just getting set up um, at the moment and um, we'll get started in just a minute or two. Welcome everyone who's logged on online so far. Um, so um, today um, we have Colin Hunt speaking um, from the Canadian Nuclear Society. I'm very excited to have um, Colin speaking um, and on his um, UK tour that he's doing this week. Uh, he's currently based at the CRA offices in London doing this presentation. So he's got um, an audience there in person as well as um, you all logged on online today. So uh, we're just going to just check whether he's all right on his end. Uh, are you all right to get started, Colin? Yes, good morning, everyone. And I okay. trust everyone. I trust everyone can hear me uh, reasonably well. I have a presentation to give this morning. Uh, I'll speak for about 40 to 45 minutes, and then any, anyone and everyone will have a chance to ask questions of me of anything I've presented or indeed anything at all about the nuclear industry and nuclear science and technology in Canada. So without more ado, I'll begin. Um, I'm the secretary of the Canadian Nuclear Society and the Canadian Nuclear Society, as you can see here, it was established in 1979 initially as the technical arm of the Canadian Nuclear Association. We are a voluntary, not-for-profit membership society. We have 12 branches across Canada, and we have approximately 1,000 members uh, total in our society. Uh, indicated below, the mission of the Canadian Nuclear Society will be similar to that of the uh, UKNI. We are a forum for exchange of information on nuclear science and technology. Um, our purpose is to advance knowledge, education, and understanding in nuclear technology and science. Uh, and we're also to encourage and support professional development of those engaged in such activities in Canada. This talk is going to be broken into three parts. And the first part, I want to give people an idea of what a CANDU reactor looks like and how it functions. All power reactors in Canada are the can-do type. Um, uh, it, this is a very different reactor configuration from anything you're used to in Britain. The main reactor is this central structure here, the reactor itself is this central cylindrical structure you can see in the middle of this diagram. It's got uh, cold uh, water coming in from the right and hot steam leaving on the left and it goes up into the boiler and is then reheated and goes back into, into the reactor again. There is a secondary loop which goes from the boiler through the steam turbine, uh, spins the turbine and the generator and then is recovered back through uh, the cold return back to the boilers and finally, what you can see, the final water system indicated is cooling water from the lake. Uh, reactors in Canada are all located near large water bodies, so there is, no uh, there is no open or closed circuit cooling towers with our reactors. They all use direct intake from lakes or the Atlantic Ocean uh, and return. What makes the CANDU reactor different is its fuel configuration. Unlike most of the reactors you may be used to around the world, 
Kandu is a fuel channel reactor. It is not a pressure vessel reactor. This is a schematic diagram, which you can see here, of some of the main elements of the Kandu system. There are a number of long cylinders. You'll see a better uh, graphic of these in a moment. A number of long cylinders all uh, uh, attached to each other by end plates. And within each of these cylinders, you can see these small little cylinders. They actually look more like discs, as soon as I find the mouse here, uh, filling each of these cylinders or what we call fuel elements or pencils. All of this fuel is contained inside a double tube system, and you can see the inner tube here, which we call a fuel channel. This tube is filled with hot coolant. It flows one in one end of the tube and out the other. It will flow in one end and out the back end. Here you can see an over, a larger image of what a fuel bundle looks like. Within each fuel channel in a reactor, there will be 12 or 13 of these fuel bundles end to end. In each CANDU reactor, there will be in total about 480 fuel channels, each of them loaded with a dozen fuel bundles from end to end. That's the only part of the reactor which is actually under pressure. Uh, all the rest of the reactor surrounding the fuel channels, and I'll show you this in a moment, is in fact at STP, standard temperature and pressure. The fuel inside the fuel bundle, if I can find the mouse, this is the fuel, these little uh, disks here, are natural uranium. They're not enriched. Uh, uh, it is natural ur uranium in the chemical configuration UO2, uranium dioxide. In this photo, you can see the face of a CANDU reactor, and you can see all of the fuel channels. Oh, oh. You can see all of the ends of the fuel channels in here, all in here. This square object here is called the calandria, and it contains the moderator of the CANDU reactor. The moderator is heavy water, D2O. Uh, D2O is an artificial substance. You have to make it and you make it from deut uh, normal deuterium, which exists uh, in nature. It's about one part per, se per 7,000 of just about any glass of water that you care to uh, take out of the tap. Um, deuterium occurs naturally, and it occurs in the chemical form of DHO, or deuterium hydrogen oxygen. So, uh, that's why it's called heavy water. It, it has one extra neutron in the one of the hydrogen atoms, and so is slightly heavier. The Kander reactor is surrounded, and you can see it in this photo with this, these silvery areas. That's the shield tank. That's the principal in, um, immediate radiation barrier around a Kander reactor. This is all filled with cold, heavy water, uh, about six or 700 tons of it around the shield tank. Finally, what is missing from this photo uh, when a CANDU is finished is that out the end of each of these fuel channels find most, will be a plug and a large pipe from each one of them going up to a steam drum above the reactor where all the hot uh, coolant from the reactor is collected and then sent to the boilers. So it, it's in fact a very large plumbing project. These would be called feeder tubes, and they would all come out of one out of each of these fuel channels goes up to a steam drum above, and at the other end of the reactor, about 20 or 30 feet away, would be equally a large number of feeder tubes coming back from the steam drums and the uh, uh, boilers returning 
hot um, uh, cold coolant now back into the reactor to be heated up again. The Kandu reactor is a relatively cold reactor. Its core operating temperature is on the order of about 325 degrees Celsius. As I said before, in this whole reactor, the only thing which is under pressure are the fuel channels themselves. All these interstices are all filled with the moderator, which at normal operating condi um, uh, conditions is about 70 degrees Celsius. So it's about as hot as your hot water tank at home. Um, what separates the high heat from the fuel channel from the cold moderator and shield tank surrounding. As I mentioned before, it's a double walled, each one of these tubes is a double wall. The tubes are separated by an annulus gas, which provides the thermal insulation between the two. So that very quickly is the nature of a Kandu reactor. Uh, you'll also notice from the uh, size of the fellows there, it's a very large reactor. It has to be a very large reactor because it uses natural uranium, not enriched fuel. What you can see on the screen here is Canada's first prototype CANDU reactor. It's called NPD2. It's located in Ralston, Ontario, on the Ottawa River, north of the city of Ottawa. The reactor was built in the late 1950s and it entered service in 1962. The important point about Ralston, it was a relatively small reactor at the time, only about 30 megawatts thermal. It was originally designed when it was first conceived of in the late 1950s as a, uh, a version of a boiling water reactor with a pressure vessel. Midway during construction, they decided that there was a better way to configure the reactor they wanted to build. And in mid-design, they literally changed it to a fuel channel reactor, and the result is uh, was this facility. The reactor itself is this building here, and these are all ancillary service buildings which were built uh, years after. Um, the reactor was used extensively. Uh, it was uh, after it demonstrated Kandu in 1962. In the late 1960s and from then on, it was used as the principal training facility for operators of the large commercial Kandu plants. Uh, you can still find many people today in Ontario, in Ontario's nuclear power industry, who did their training here at Ralston. Um, there is also a British connection with NPD2. Um, the first head of the CEGB was Lord Christopher Hinton. And in the early 1960s, he was unhappy with the prospect of what Britain was looking at in terms of power generation reactors, which was later became the Magnox reactor. And he and his team at the CEGB came out to Canada and they were there to observe the uh, construction, final construction and operation of NPD do. Um, he returned to the United Kingdom in, in 1963, made a recommendation that Britain seriously consider licensing uh, can do for operation in Britain, and that's the last that was ever heard of such a proposal. I'm going to turn now to operating uh, uh, commercial facilities. And what you see here is the Bruce Power Complex. Uh, Bruce Power is located at the foot of the Bruce Peninsula on the eastern shore of Lake Huron in Ontario. This is an older photograph, which I'm using deliberately for reasons I'll illustrate in a moment. The Bruce Power Complex is the largest operating nuclear power complex in the world. It has nine reactors on site, and they are uh, 
Let's see if I can find the mouse. Here we go. This is the oldest um, oldest commercial part of the, of the facility. This up here where the, I've got the mouse. At the top left, that long red building is the Bruce A power complex. It consists of four reactors numbered from uh, right to left, Bruce units one to four. In the center of the screen, much larger, oriented north and south, is the Bruce B complex, again consisting of four reactors uh, numbered five to eight. Five, six, seven, eight. Each of the reactors at Bruce Power it has a uh, full power rating of approximately 850 to 880 megawatts. Out the back of each of these, uh, oh, uh, and ju just to continue for a moment, the, this long building here is the turbine hall. To the right of it is the main switchyard for the Bruce B plant. Bruce A will have its own switching yard much closer to, to it and it's difficult to see in this photograph. Sitting behind it, this white cylinder here is the vacuum chamber. This is one of the principal uh, containment safety containment features in uh, multi-unit can-do stations. The um, um, uh, principle behind this is should there be a loss of coolant accident within the reactors, a series of relief valves will open up and instead of simply, instead of uh, the steam venting into the station, it will all be drawn into this vacuum chamber which is filled with has thousands of, and thousands of liters of cold water at the top, which will then be released down into this chamber full of hot steam and will condense all the gas as it's released into, into the uh, chamber drawn out of the reactor, reactor building itself. Um, the uh, concept of a vacuum chamber is, ha, is used in all of Ontario's multi-unit can-do stations. Each of the reactors does not have its own control room. Each of the multi-unit stations will have a single control room for all four reactors located roughly in the middle of each of these two complexes. Now there are a couple of other features that I want to illustrate in this photo. Um, first, on the far upper left, this small white dome is the second of Canada's prototype reactors. This is Douglas Point. It was uh, built and started operating in 1968 and shut down in the late 1980s. It was the first full-scale CANDU demonstration plant. This is also the reactor that was used and uh, later copied by India for all of its 220 megawatt uh, uh, heavy power uh, heavy water uh, moderated power reactors. There is a large complex in the upper left of the photo, which I'm, I'm going to put, it looks something like an oil refinery, but it's not. They're here and here. Those are the Bruce A and Bruce B heavy water plants. Those, uh, were, there was originally supposed to be a third one, but you can see that the pad for it to the right, to the right of all that, there's just two, two small white cylinders there. There were originally supposed to be three heavy water plants. Uh, these were the uh, units which were intended to produce heavy water from natural lake water. You draw in lake water. You, you uh, uh, subject it to an ion exchange and you would then uh, release cold lake water back to the lake and you'd be left with uh, uh, pure D2O. Um, in terms of heavy water, there is a general rule of thumb which is rather useful. 
if a CANDA reactor is about, say, 800 megawatts, then the rule of thumb would be it needs about 800 tons of heavy water, approximately half of it in the coolant and half of it in the, mod in the moderator tank. Uh, heavy water is not cheap. You have to make it. And, and this is one of the reasons why building a CANDA reactor can be more expensive than any other kind of reactor. But because it uses natural fuel, and because its fuel is easy to manufacture, it usually has lower operating costs and with good performance, lower lifetime operating costs. In any event, this is the Bruce Power Complex. It is the largest uh, uh, nuclear uh, generating operating complex in the world. It is, in fact, the third largest nuclear uh, electric generating complex of any kind in the world. It's a third only to uh, the Itaipu Dam in Brazil and Three Gorges in China. Bruce Power has gone through extensive uh, repairs and upgrading to re over the last 15 years to restore its performance to what it was nominally when it was first built. What you can see, and this gives you a, uh, an example of the size and scale of the facility, this is the uh, repair and reinstallation of a turbine spindle in one of the reactors. What you can see on the center left is uh, one of three low-pressure turbines for a Bruce reactor, and uh, the object being suspended by the crane is, in fact, the uh, re uh, turbine rotor itself. Um, when fully assembled, at the left end is where the turbine, uh, where the electro generator is. What you see in the image here is Canada's newest nuclear power station called Darlington. It exists about an hour and a half drive east of the city of Toronto on Lake Ontario. There are four reactors at Darlington. I can get the bows here. There we go. Reactor one, and then to the right of it, unit two, and then just beyond the, the um, central facilities, unit three and four. Uh, like all of Canada's reactors, uh, Darlington has no cooling towers. It does all of its steam condensation by direct intake from the lake, and you can see the main intake right there in the photo which surrounds the, the uh, power station. Um, uh, water is taken in from a Great Lake, or in the case of one reactor, the Atlantic Ocean, and then it is discharged back to the lake through a discharge tunnel going out under the water approximately three or four kilometers. Um, a very long discharge is used to return the um, uh, warmed water from steam condensation, and the reason it, is, it does that is so that uh, the lake itself will not be warmed by the plant discharge. In the case of Darlington, I believe its design requirement is that it must warm the ambient lake water no more than half a degree Celsius within two meters of the discharge pipe. As I mentioned before, Darlington is Canada's newest uh, uh, nuclear uh, power project. Nuclear power project. It was built in the period 1982 to 1992. It has thus been in service for just over 20 years. In October of 2016, the Ontario government agreed that uh, refurbishment of Ontario's nuclear power was in fact the best op option for the province in terms of medium and long-term electricity supply. Accordingly, Darlington Unit 2, this one right here, commenced a two and a quarter year shutdown. Uh, and during that, sh that shutdown, all of its 
uh, pressure tubes. All of its boilers, it ha each, uh, each of these reactors has four boilers. All of the boilers, the turbo generators, um, uh, and the steam turbines will all be replaced along with a large number of the class one and class three electrical systems within the plant. In total, uh, the, uh, each of these reactors will be refurbished sequentially, starting with unit two, then going to unit three, then unit one at the far left end, and then finally unit four. Uh, in total, this, uh, this program will cost approximately $12 billion in Canadian dollars, and it will take about nine to 10 years to complete. Bruce Power in 2020 will be starting the same program Two of its eight units have already been re uh, refurbished successfully, and in 2020, Bruce Power will be commencing the first of its outages to re uh, refurbish and repair all of its remaining six reactors. Uh, its program will be finished by approximately 2030. The cost of Bruce Power's program is something on the order of 13 to 14 billion dollars. As a result of this, these two reactor complexes, uh, consisting of a total of a dozen reactors by themselves, will be operating in Ontario until approximately 2065. What we see here now in this photo is Canada's oldest full-size full uh, nuclear commercial generating station. This is Pickering. This is right on the outskirts of the city of Toronto. It consists of eight reactors with number one at the top of the photo and number eight closest to you. Again, you can see it has the um, uh, uh, vacuum chamber, which is the large cylinder to the left of the mall. And just beyond the reactors, you can see the turbine halls. Pickering started operation with the two units on the far left in 1971. And the first four reactors were con constructed and entered operation from 1971 to 1974. And then the B side, the four reactors closest to you, were built and entered service in the time of 1983 to 1985. Uh, the Bruce and Darlington reactors are all on the order of 850 to 900 megawatts. The Pickering reactors are somewhat smaller. They are 540 megawatts each. At this time, uh, the Pickering reactors have thus been in service for up to almost 50 years. Because of the small size of the reactors, it is not at this time judged economic to refurbish them the way it, it is uh, being done for the Bruce and Darlington reactors. However, the Ontario government and Ontario Power Generation intended to operate these reactors until 2024, and there are engineering analyses going on as, uh, and safety assessments to determine if they can be safely operated to 2028 to 2030. The final thing I would note is that two of these reactors were permanently shut down in the period of 2005. It's units two and three. These two here. Units one and four on either side of them uh, were given a thorough uh, uh, repair and upgrade program in the period prior to that. The program did not go particularly well. The, uh, technically, it was fine, but it, it cost considerably more than was first anticipated. Um, and it took a couple of years longer than had originally been anticipated. And based on that experience, it was decided not to carry on with Units 2 and 3. There is another important consideration here for Pickering. These were built in the 1970s. 
equipment obsolescence at this point with reactors that old starts to play uh, become a serious factor. If and I've been through it many times. If you go through the Pickering Nuclear Station, you will see a large number of nameplates of companies which no longer exist. And so finding new components to replace worn out ones can be a difficult challenge to, ma to match it, uh, to meet. The final thing I would like you to note about Pickering is what, please observe all this stuff out here. What is that? When Pickering was built, most of that was farm fields. The nuclear station came along, and then after it, the city of Pickering grew up around the nuclear station. It is an object of, of some discussion as to whether it's appropriate to have a nuclear power station in the middle of what is now a city. Uh, but I would suggest to my listeners here that given that the plant came first, and the homes and houses came second. People, regardless of what they have said, people have made their own decisions about the safety of nuclear power at, in, it, in proximity because they went and built homes there and bought land there and it's been that way in situation for more than 30 years. Shown in this image is Point of Pro. Point La Pro is the one power reactor operating in Canada, which is not in Ontario. Point La Pro is in the province of New Brunswick. It is a single standalone can-do reactor. It takes its steam condensation water from the Atlantic Ocean, uh, condenses steam in the turbine hall, and then discharges it back to the ocean. Point La Pro, this is called a can-do six reactor. There are a number of them around the world, two in Canada and uh, more than half a dozen located in other countries which have purchased and, and now use Canadian uh, nuclear reactor technology. Point La Pro is the first CANDU-6 built and it's the technical reference plant for all CANDU-6 type reactors. Point La Pro went through a complete refurbishment in the period uh, 2008 to 2012, again, like the other refurbishments which are going on in Ontario, all of its reactor internal components, its uh, steam generators, and its turbines were all replaced and upgraded. Point La Pro is approximately 660 megawatts. That is approximately 30% of all of the electricity in demand in the province of New Brunswick. Uh, for a number of years, this would be in the period roughly 1988 to 1992, Point La Pro was also the top performing power reactor in the world. For four straight years, it had capacity factors in excess of 95%. By way of electricity concentration, I should also refer to Ontario. I've mentioned New Brunswick. I should also mention Ontario. In Ontario, nuclear power is about 65% of Ontario's total electricity supply in terms of kilowatt hours or terawatt hours. Uh, Ontario has an electricity mix, which is today approximately 65% nuclear, about 20 to 25% hydraulic, and of the remainder, about half is gas, say three or four percent, and about half is wind, say three or four percent. Shown here is the nuclear generating complex in the province of Quebec. This is at the station known as Gentilly. It is in, if you look on a map, on Trois-Rivières on the St. Lawrence River. It consists of two reactors, the one closest to you is not a can-do. It's the only reactor in Canada, uh, uh, can, reactor in Canada which is not can-do for power generating purposes. And the other one with the bright white do uh, uh, reactor dome just beyond it is Gentil 2. It is a can-do 6 reactor. It's the second of the can-do 6s built in Canada. Um, I'll talk about them briefly. The one closest to you called, uh, is called Gentil 1. 
was a boiling water type reactor, which Atomic Energy of Canada had built as a prototype reactor. It was not a terribly successful prototype. During five or six years, it only ran for about 180 days. The, it was decided fundamentally that whatever the physics looked like on paper, once it was built, it was fundamentally not a sound design, and it was shut down in the, uh, I believe, approximately 1979. Jean TE2, the reactor beyond, entered service in 1984, uh, and it was operated quite successfully for more than 20 years. Quebec has interesting governments. <clears throat> Every, <clears throat> excuse me. Every so often, Quebec is prone to it, uh, electing government's interest in separating Quebec from the rest of Canada. Um, this, go this government is also known as the one which attracts most of the green movement support. At the time, about 10 years ago, uh, Quebec was being run by uh, the Parti Québécois, which is a separatist party, and being green in orientation, Rather than refit and refurbish it on T2 for continued operation, they decided, thank you, no very much, we're just going to shut it down. This will have consequences in the future. In 1997-98, Quebec and eastern Ontario were hit by a very severe ice storm. The magnitude of this ice storm was truly impressive. It destroyed all of the large hydraulic transmission lines from northern Quebec and from Labrador, blacking out most of the province for three weeks. Being without power in Canada in February is no joke. Uh, large parts of the city of Montreal, large numbers of small towns had to be entirely evacuated because there's no heat. Your furnace won't work. It doesn't matter if it's a gas-fired furnace. He uses an electric timer to start it and operate it. There was no heat, there was no light, there was no nothing. The only electricity there was in southern Quebec was Jean T2. Now Jean T2 at 650 megawatts can't possibly power the city of Montreal. The city of Montreal is a city of four and a half million. But what it could do and what it did do was it maintained electricity into all of Montreal's hospital hospitals, and common uh, public emergency and service areas. Today, Quebec will not have that, that supply of power adjacent to the city of Montreal and the city of Quebec, uh, and Quebec City. The lesson from the um, Great Ice Storm for us was that it is always very useful to have some large um, source of baseload electricity relatively close to where electricity to the demand point. Long, large transmission lines can be extremely vulnerable to weather-related events. Shown here is the last of the Kandu projects built. This is the Qinshan site in China. This is approximately 100 kilometers south of Shanghai. Um, in the late 1990s, Shanghai contracted with Atomic Energy of Canada Limited to build two Kandu reactors. You can see them there under construction. This is taken approximately in the year 2000. These are two Kandu 6 reactors. Um, because of efficiencies and improvements in materials, Kandu 6, by the time Kinshan was built, was now 700 megawatts or more as single standalone units. These are known as, China knows them as Kinshan Phase 3, uh, and we in the Canadian nuclear industry call them Kinshan 4 and 5. Uh, Kinshan Phase 1 and 2 were domestic Chinese pressure vessel type reactors. Now, Kinshan is a tiny site, and you can get an idea of how small it is in that photograph, because what you can see there on the right is a mountain. The small flat area was in fact artificially created by the China National Nuclear Corporation, specifically 
for the site where it was going to locate these two reactors. As a result of this very tiny footprint, um, a number of engineering improvements had to be made to nuclear reactor construction, and we're going to see that in just the next few slides. Um, this is a Kandu Calandria, the reactor tank itself being moved to uh, into Kinshan. I've just included this photo as a matter of interest to show the size of a Kandu reactor, uh, the actual reactor part of the reactor. This was made in Alstom. Its last uh, uh, manufacturing and forging plant was just south of uh, the city of Montreal. This shows some interesting and new engineering techniques whereby Kinshan was assembled. It was the first reactor that Canada had ever done, which was based on a fully modular method of construction. Because of the limited footprint of the Kinshan site, there was no, there was no room for a large laydown yard where equipment, equipment, trucks and so forth could be assembled. Modules, in fact, would have to be assembled off-site, moved as modules into the Kinshan site, and then lowered into place by large cranes. And you can see the cap of one of the uh, Kinshan reactors being lowered here. Here is an example of another module being lowered into place in one of the, one of the uh, Kinshan reactors. These would be assembled as full decks, which would look something like this and then would simply get stacked one on, not simply, it's simply said, but not so easily done. They would get stacked one on top of each other as you built your way up through the react reactor building. So when it's, it's finished, the Kinshan site looked like this. As I mentioned, it, this was the first example of a candy reactor which used modular construction. Like Kandu reactors in Canada, there's no cooling towers. It uses direct water intake from the uh, Yellow Sea, I believe. Um, and as, as I said, it's a very small footprint. This plant was constructed. A unit four at the back of the photo uh, was finished 30 days ahead of schedule. And unit five closest to you was finished 100 days ahead of schedule. And correspondingly, uh, both reactors came in under budget as well. I'm going to turn from power reactors now briefly to start to look at uh, uh, the medical and industrial isotope industry in Canada. What you see in this photograph is Cobalt 60. This is a storage bay at Nordion in Ottawa for cobalt cores. Um, it, when you look at, uh, ignore the very bright shapes at the top and center, those are just reflections of, uh, on the surface of the water. This is very clear water, uh, which has been completely demineralized. The old cobalt is in these large canisters in the upper left of the photo, and new cobalt are the very bright circles at the bottom center of this photo of this photograph. Uh, cobalt is produced in reactors by neutron bombardment. You take cobalt 59, bombard it with neutrons, and you get cobalt 60. Cobalt 60 has a half-life of about about 10 years and a bit. It is highly radioactive and it is a gamma emitter and that's why cobalt is used. Uh, it was originally developed and continues to be uh, used today for radiotherapy for cancer treatment. Canada produces produced most of the world's cobalt. It was produced at the NR uh, was produced primarily at the NRU uh, research reactor in Chalk River. The NRU reactor was shut down this past March and cobalt is being produced at a variety of places within existing Kandu power reactors. And I'll get to that technology in a few minutes. <coughs> Kandu, uh, Canadian uh, nuclear industry produces a large number of radioisotopes 
for medical and industrial applications. One of the most important is molybdenum-99. Some of you may have heard of it. It is used for, uh, nuclear, for nuclear imaging of internal body tissues. Um, it is different from x-rays or from other imaging techniques which may only give you surface uh, imaging. Molly 99 is the substance which produces technetium 99, referred to down here. These are very short half-life isotopes. Molly 99 has a half-life of about three days, and technetium 99, which is the stuff you actually want, has a half-life of about 12 hours. These are uh, uh, gamma emitters, very high energy gamma emitters, but they have a very short half-life, which is why they are so useful for um, medical imaging. Uh, a patient may get a relatively large radiation dose from being administered these, but it dissipates very rapidly. Molly 99 is produced at five research reactors around the world, one of which was at Chalk River, uh, the NRU, um, a National Research Universal is what NRU stands for. Five reactors around the world, all of them research reactors, and all of them built in the period roughly 1958 to 1965. All of these reactors are of a similar age. They all produced all of the world's supply of Molly 99, and all of them are slowly but surely going out of service because of now their considerable age and longevity. As I say, NRU ceased production of Molly 99 in uh, 2018, in March, at the end of March, in fact. And in future, it's expected that Molly 99 will be produced by particle accelerators and not reactors. Um, that will mean much more expensive medical radioisotopes being produced, given that you're limited to particle accelerators, but there it is. At this point, uh, Hugh, can you help me run the videos? Yeah, sure. My name is Norm LaPerrier. I'm a radiation oncologist at Princess Margaret Hospital, and I've been practicing for 33 years. Back in the 1950s, cobalt was a major breakthrough in terms of using its application for treating cancer. Cobalt has taken another step up with the development of the unit behind me called the Gamma Knife Unit. This unit now allows us to target deep inside the patient's brain, avoiding significant risks with open head surgery. This is the metastatic sarcoma in the brain. Where this large lump used to be, there's just a little black hole now because the cancer has been obliterated. It used to be when you had brain metastases, that'd be the end of your options. But now, over 95% of patients will have their brain disease control. Cobalt-60 is a reactive substance that's used in these treatment units. And without the nuclear industry, we would never be using these things. They wouldn't have the activity to be able to deliver a useful dose of radiation. They sat us down in a room and said to my mom, your child has a grade three and You, of course, at first don't believe that it's actually happening to your child. She had known that my mother had passed away from cancer. I never knew what was about to unfold before me. I've had surgery, radiation, chemo, usually with a regular surgery, I'm in like maybe two days. But I was home that afternoon when I had Game and I, I told everyone I wanted to rename it the Magic Rainbow Bean because they're just beans going into your head and it makes cancer go away. So it's really cool that we have technology nowadays that can do that.
So just to uh, make some concluding remarks on those two videos uh, that you just saw. Uh, first, with respect to cobalt, it used to be they had to be produced as targets in a research reactor. Well, if the re research reactor goes out of business, you can't put targets in a power reactor. The temperatures are too high, the conditions are too hostile. Um, Bruce Power and uh, uh, Canadian Nuclear Labs have developed techniques now whereby cobalt can be put into a can-do fuel bundle, put into the reactor, and extracted back out of the reactor, converting it into from cobalt-59 into cobalt-60. This is something very new. And the advantage of it, and Kendu reactors can do this because they have online refueling. You can change the fuel in the reactor while it continues operating. And this is necessary and useful because fuel in a Kendu reactor typically stays in the reactor for 18 months. Well, cobalt takes less time to produce than 18 months. So rather than having to shut the reactor down, you can simply have it in certain designated bundles and with the online refueling system, pull the cobalt out of the reactor when it is in fact finished and ready to go for processing into uh, cobalt-60 cores. This is a relatively new technology and Bruce Power has just started doing it last year. That's the first thing I would say about cobalt. Second, the first video talked about a gamma knife. This is a very specialized way of using uh, uh, cobalt in a much more targeted three-dimensional way than was previously possible. The existing, uh, the pre previous uh, traditional cobalt treatments, you had a machine which emitted a strong beam of gamma radiation. The pro this may very well kill the cancer at the cancer site, but it will also kill anything that it travels through the body to get to. The gamma knife was a very different concept. Rather than having one strong ga uh, gamma beam, you have six in an array, and you would only get the strong cancer treatment where the six beams intersect. The advantage of this is you can have these gammas travel through a human body with little or no biological effect, unlike the previous cancer, uh, radiation cancer treatments. They only have effect at the uh, site that they all six beams are focused directly upon. Turning from medical radiation, I'm going to look uh, finally at the last major aspect of the modern Canadian nuclear industry. This is uranium mining. Canada produces, it's the second largest producer of uranium in the world. All of this comes from northern Saskatchewan, roughly the northern third of the province, in a geologic formation called the Athabasca Basin. It's basically a large oval-shaped depression, and all around the edges of the depression are rather rich uranium deposits. The largest of these is at MacArthur River. This is the pithead of the MacArthur River uranium mine. This mine alone produces approximately 65 to 7,000 tons, 6,500 to 7,000 tons of uranium annually. That's on the order of about 12% of the world's total uranium demand from all of its commercial power reactors. Uh, MacArthur River is an unusually rich mine. When nuclear power first started in the late 1950s and 1960s, it was believed that uranium was a relatively scarce uh, commodity. And early uranium mines from those years could be a fraction of 1% in terms of ore yield. This is very different at MacArthur River. It's very different at most of the Athabasca mines, but this one in particular. The average ore yield at MacArthur River is 25%. It has peak values as high as 75% of pure uranium trioxide. As a result, MacArthur River cannot be mined conventionally. The problem is not uranium, the problem is the radon gas. Um, at MacArthur River, the radon emissions from open face conventional mining would be so high 
that the treatment for the, the way you uh, deal with radon gas is you ventilate. Uh, the higher the radon gas, the more you ventilate to keep the radon, radon levels down. However, the radon levels at MacArthur River would be so high from conventional mining that you'd start lifting uranium dust up off the floor. That would be the second uh, uh, radioactive hazard from mining uh, would be inhaled dust. So instead, in, at MacArthur River, what they do is something called raised boring. And raised boring is you drill a gallery above the ore body and another one below it, and then you drill you, you drill refrigerant coolant pipes between one gallery and the other, and you run uh, refrigerant coolant through it for several months, freeze the whole ore body so solid, and then once you've frozen it solid, you drill through the ore body and turn it into a slurry. It's collected by a, um, um, a tank train in the lower gallery, and away it goes off to the refinery. And there's, in fact, no ore, uh, ore face at all in the mine. Um, here is a typical working gallery at MacArthur River. Uh, this is a lower gallery. Um, and you'll notice that compared with traditional images of mining, this is an extremely clean photo. Uh, one of the, as I said, principal radioactive hazards would be inhaled uh, um, uh, dust from uh, active ore. And so uh, at MacArthur River and all Canadian uranium mines, extensive measures are taken to reduce and eliminate dust. One other thing I should mention uh, on this topic, MacArthur River and Canvas uranium mines, in producing about 10,000 tons of uranium a year, if you convert that uranium into electricity through a nuclear power reactor, Canada's uranium mines produce about double the amount of energy that Canada's entire oil and gas produces and exports in energy equivalents. In the case of MacArthur River, 25 people work on shift. Not 200,000, 25, 25. McLean Lake is an example of another active Canadian uranium mine. It too is in northern Saskatchewan. You can see an aerial view here. And there are, it was both a surface and an underground mine. The surface is here and here. These were the initial deposits that were mined out from the surface. And in the case of this large one on the left, which I pointed to, it has now been converted into a tailings management facility. Tailings from mining operations go into this pit, and the pit is sealed underneath it and above the tailings with clay as the um, uh, tailings are accumulated from other workings in the mine. And it will be at, at, at the end of the mine's life. This tailings facility will be sealed and closed. These group of black buildings in the center right, that's the underground uh, workings of the McLean Lake mine. It also includes the largest of those buildings is the McLean Lake uranium mill. Uh, my, uh, pitch blend from Canadian mines come to McLean Lake, and there it's refined into pure U308. And U308 is, in fact, the mineral which will be used to produce uh, nuclear fuel later on. McLean, the McLean Lake Mill takes all of the uh, 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 ore production from MacArthur River, which was shown earlier, as well as a couple of other mines in Canada. All of the uranium mined, mined in Canada comes here. This is the Port Hope fuel uh, manufacturing facility. It's about two hours, about an hour and a half drive east of the city of Toronto on Lake Ontario. 
The Port Hope facility started life in the early 1930s as a cobalt refinery. Cobalt was used industrially for non-electrical lighting in watch dials and in aircraft dials. And in fact, this facility was used uh, up to and through the Second World War, principally in aircraft illumination production. Cobalt, of course, is no longer used in non-electrical lighting. Cobalt has rather high radiation fields. But after World War II, uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, the cobalt works were transformed into a uranium fuel production and uranium conversion plant. There are two main parts to the uh, Port Hope facility. There's the large towers here, here. This is the uranium conversion plant. There are about five of these plants in the world. They take uranium trioxide, UO3, and convert it into a substance called uranium hexafluoride, UF6. UF6 is the feedstock material which goes into all the world's enrichment plants to make enriched nuclear fuel to increase the proportion of U-235 in the uranium. Most of Canada's uranium is exported and goes through this uranium conversion facility here. Down at the fore left foreground, this complex here is specifically the fuel complex for making the fuel natural uranium fuel which goes into CANDU reactors and it goes in as the chemical formula uranium dioxide. So those are the two forms in which Canada's uranium is, is um, fabricated and exported and all of it goes through Port Hope. I'd like to conclude my talk by noting some what are expected to be the developments in Canada's nuclear industry over the next five to ten years. It comes in two parts. First is uh, conventional nuclear technology, which would be CANDU. I've discussed at some detail the refurbishment work going on at Bruce and Darlington. I should also mention that there are prospects and in fact ongoing projects of new Ken, excuse me, Kendu reactors in Argentina, China and Romania. Argentina and Romania at this point are still speculative. Uh, the new Kendu project in China is very much an, uh, an ongoing project which will start construction in a few years. There are existing Kendu reactors built by Canada in the following nations. Argentina, Romania, South Korea. Then we come to new talk, uh, new reactor technology. Canada has become a center of uh, research and collaboration on new nuclear technologies, uh, primarily focused around small modular reactors. At this time, there are 10 applications before the Canadian regulator, Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, looking for design approval. Some of these are from companies in Canada. Some of these are from companies in the United States. And two of them are from Britain, Maltex and U Battery. Have both been uh, consulting with Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission on approval of their design. In Canada, what that means is it comes in two stages. First stage is you present your concept of a reactor to the regulator, and the regulator reviews the concept to determine does it meet generally uh, the regulator's national safety requirements. If they say yes, then you go to stage two. Stage two would be you present the detailed engineering of what, of what your reactor is, and they do a detailed safety analysis. If they say yes to the second phase, then you can then apply to the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission for permission to build a prototype or demonstration project. At this time, uh, one applicant has received, uh, has received permission from phase one. Uh, the review took approximately 14 months. 
and they are now proceeding to uh, they they've taken their their results. They're going back home. They're going to present a detailed uh, 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 sketch uh, drawing uh, plan of their reactor, and they will table that in about a year's time or so for the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission to uh, review stage two. When that's done, it's expected that this particular company, Terrestrial Energy, will in fact be applying to build a prototype small modular reactor in about five years' time. At the moment, it looks likely that that will be at the Chalk River National Laboratories. As I said, there are 10 applications before them, and there are a total of 22 consortia and companies and other entities who are engaged in direct discussions with the Canadian nuclear regulator on uh, uh, safety approval and uh, with, a pro with a view to prototype construction. Uh, Canadian Nuclear Laboratories last year called for expressions of interest from anyone interested in uh, uh, partnering with them for prototype construction. They received over 80 applicants who had expressed interest in collaborating with some part. I think I'll stop there and open for any questions you may have. Thank you uh, very much for that, Colin. That was very interesting indeed. We only have one question from Jamie, Jamie McDonald, who asks, um, Canada seems to be a very attractive location to build first-of-a-kind Generation 4 reactors, for example, Maltex Energy and Terrestrial Energy, both looking to build there. Why do you think this is, and has it been a deliberate strategy from the government and industry? This is a very good question, and it has a rather complicated answer. I'll try to simplify it as much as possible. There are several factors which prevail here. First, and this is not in order of significance, all of these are important reasons. First, Canada has a very stable, well-established regulatory regime. Uh, for at least the past 10 years, Canada has an, had an effective nuclear regulatory body which has been clear and precise in its directions to licensees or applicants as to what conditions and standards they would have to meet. And when an application was made to it, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission has been prompt and decisive in making its decision either yes or no. Um, and part and parcel of that was the regulator has built up over the last decade a reputation for, I would call it probity, that its decisions are not countered or slowed up by government or political, for political or other non-technical reasons. So regulatory stability is the first and perhaps one of the most prominent reasons. The second one is because of Canada's long experience in building CANDU reactors. Canada has a very large industrial infrastructure in building nuclear components regardless of what the design or architecture of those nuclear systems may be. It is not every country which can provide a nuclear designer with a full complex spectrum of nuclear suppliers capable of meeting your, your uh, contracting needs. By and large, Canada retains the ability to produce all the components that go in CANDU reactors, accepting only large forgings. Um, and that is about as complete a supply chain as one can find just about anywhere. Because of this, then, Canada becomes an attractive place for relatively small companies looking at finding a place which can meet all of their technical and support and uh, component needs, regardless of what kind of uh, component system they're looking at. Third, Canada has a large national laboratory. Uh, it's known as the Chalk River Labs. It was uh, owned by Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, and it's now operated by a private consortia called Canadian Nuclear Laboratories. 
Chalk River Labs is a very large site. It has very large and extensive uh, applied research capability and equipment, and it provides a very useful partner for any engineering companies, uh, large or small, for on-site facility and material research and investigation. There are a few other reasons, but these, I think, are the three principal reasons why Canada has become, in re quite recent years, um, a leader in uh, attracting uh, proposals for research and development in small modular reactors. This is not particularly government policy. It's some of the natural advantages which the Canadian nuclear industry has acquired over the previous decades. Thank you very much for answering that. We have a few other questions, but unfortunately we've run out of time at this point. Um, thank you again, Colin, for the very interesting presentation. Um, and thank you everyone else for joining us. This will be put onto our website in the next couple of days. But otherwise, um, have a lovely rest of the day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry, I didn't have a clock, so I talked at the time too much.